Well, a very warm welcome to this Asia and Pacific Transport Forum, everyone. I'd like to welcome the ADB Developing Member Country counterparts, donor partners, and the ADB Transport community, academia, and the private sector to this forum. Now, you'll be seeing how to download the Event Air app next, and it will be coming onto your screen. This will give you instructions on how to ask questions during this forum once we get started with our discussion. So please, if you've not already done so, can you please download the Events Air app and uh, that will enable you to participate fully in this forum, which we'd love for you to do. Now we'll get to hear from some great speakers and representatives from these very different areas I mentioned earlier during this session. Uh, this session, of course, is coming to you virtually via Zoom for the first time this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has changed not only the nature of conferences, uh, but also the ADB's annual AGM and the transport and travel industries. The lockdowns in the last few months and travel restrictions have limited both physical interaction and economic activities. So in this session, we'll aim to discover what's next as uh, countries open up and new travel patterns emerge. What will the new normal look like? And can this new normal for transport be an opportunity uh, to address many of the historical issues and shortcomings to enable inclusive, green and affordable mobility for people and movement of goods? Well, to welcome you all to this session with an opening address, I'd like to introduce the ADB president, Masa Asakawa, to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Asian Development Bank, I would like to welcome you to the Asia and the Pacific Transport Forum 2020. ADB has held a transport forum every two years since 2008. From small beginnings, we grew uh, to 800 attendees as the last event in uh, 2018, and we have over 1,200 registered participants for this uh, virtual event. Though travel is not possible, we should not be deterred uh, from discussing the critical issues that the transport sector is facing in these uncertain times. We face new and significant challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The region's vibrant cities ground to a halt and travel was largely banned. The freedom of mobility that felt so natural was suddenly unavailable as workers who once struggled on their daily commute now struggle with an absence of transport options. The pandemic has dealt the transport sector a massive blow that will be felt for years. Urban public transport is struggling to adapt as enforced travel restriction, restrictions coupled with reluctance uh, to travel on clouded systems contribute to sharply reduced demand. As a result, the financial sustainability of public transport and millions of jobs in the sector are at risk. Airlines have also seen a substantial decrease in demand and face an uncertain future. On the other hand, private transport has in many cases returned to pre-pandemic levels. A variety of delivery services in urban areas have seen tremendous growth. This has brought the return of congestion and worsening local air pollution to many cities and contributing further to climate change. Our work now is to focus on mitigating the negative effects of the pandemic so that economies can adapt to the changed landscape and rejuvenate transport services. At the same time, issues that existed, existed before the pandemic still require action. These include transport infrastructure, road safety, and freight and public transport challenges. To achieve a sustainable recovery, we need to take a holistic approach to rebuilding economies and transport systems. Let me briefly describe how ADB is supporting its developing member countries during these difficult and uncertain times. 
ADB responded rapidly uh, to the pandemic with a comprehensive $20 billion package announced in April. The package consists of three pillars. First, grants and technical assistance are addressing the urgent health crisis, including meeting needs for ventilators, test kits, and personal protective equipment. Second, we are providing quick disbursing budget support under a new financing modality called COVID-19 Pandemic Response Option, or CIPRO. And third, we are supporting the private sector by helping companies continue to operate and keep workers employed. As of today, we have committed $9.3 billion of this comprehensive package, which includes $7 billion CIPRO for 17 countries and $1.3 billion for the private sector. Let me also stress that as ADB responds swiftly and decisively to the pandemic, we also continue to provide substantial support to build up the region's transport infrastructure and services. For example, we have signed a $235 million loan with Pakistan for the Karate Bus Rapid Transit System. In the Pacific, we are providing two loans in the maritime sector one that will improve inter-island shipping and port facilities in Kiribati, and another that will develop a new climate resi resilient port in Nauru. In Bangladesh, we are financing improvements to the quality and safety of rural roads. In addition, ADB is currently exploring measures to mitigate the operational and financial impacts of COVID-19 on public transport aviation and logistics. We are deeply aware of the ongoing need to improve transport infrastructure and services. And we will continue our efforts to support both government and private sector clients. Now, let me discuss what the transportation sector might look like under a post-pandemic new normal and how ADB will continue to address emerging issues together with our partners. After the crisis, human mobility will shift in dramatic ways. While many will choose to continue working from home, there are millions who do not have this option. Many of them will be dependent on public transport to go to work or school. The pandemic will also widen income disparities and force large numbers of people to fall back into poverty. And we continue to face a situation that is complex, fluid, and uncertain. To help developing countries pursue a path to sustainable growth, there are three critical factors that shape our support to the transport sector. You can remember them with a familiar abbreviation, SDG, which in this case, stands for safety, data, and green. Let me elaborate on each. First, safety. Ensuring safety is essential to rebuilding confidence in public transport and addressing the unsustainable shift to private vehicles. Safety should be taken into account during the planning, construction, and operational phases which will provide increased resilience against various risks, including accidents, natural disasters, and epidemics. A focus on safety will also accelerate the return of passenger, passenger demand, and trust in transport systems. Second, data. We must take the opportunity to fully understand the evolving situation presented by the pandemic and to make critical long-term plans based on data. ADB has already begun to collect evidence on changing co consumer behaviors and travel patterns. The data will inform our strategic direction for the sector and help to shape our pipeline of assistance so that ADB support will have maximum impact in a post-pandemic new normal. And third, green. 
there are many opportunities to develop a greener transport future. Let me take an example of one of the booming delivery sector. App-based delivery systems, which have rapidly become a fixture of daily urban living, also risk adding even more vehicles to the roads. This will contribute to increased congestion and air pollution. To address this, we must promote a green recovery focused on sustainability. One option is to support a shift uh, to electric vehicles. ADB also sees, sees opportunities uh, to promote walking and cycling in Asian cities and to improve the efficiency of logistics and supply chains. We will share more ideas throughout the week on how ADB is adapting our support to the realities of the new normal. We would also like very much to hear from our participants. We want to learn, for example, how the rules and restrictions of the new normal are changing how you work and live. Your input in the coming days will inform how ADB will support our developing members as we plan together for an uncertain future. We hope that this forum can give the transport community a space to help define transport for these new times. I wish you all productive discussions. Thank you. Well, that was a message from the ADB president, uh, Asakawa-san. So uh, he mentioned that this will be a full week of great discussions for the ADB Transport Forum. But at this stage, of course, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got some great speakers today. Uh, first off, we have uh, Yong Tae Kim, and he's the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, or ITF. And he'll be turning on his video shortly. And we also have Noni Purnomo, the President and Director of Bluebird PT in Indonesia. And she is also going to be turning on her video. And all the way from the US, we have Heather Thompson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Uh, and she is joining us uh, very early in the morning in the US. So thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Jamie Leather. He's the chief of the transport sector group of the ADP. Welcome to you all. I should apologize, though, for uh, Secretary Arthur Dade of the Philippines. He was going to be joining us on this session, but he was called away to an emergency intergovernmental COVID uh, session instead. So he sends his apologies. So let's start now with a quick introduction to each of you. I'm going to uh, ask you all to just give me a quick one sentence answer uh, to tell us about your area of expertise, a little bit more about your organization uh, before we get into the, uh, the gist of our discussion. So let's start with you, Mr. Young. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, morning from Paris. And um, I've been working as SG Secretary General of ITF since 2017. And ITF, as you know well, uh, this intergovernmental body composed of uh, 62 member countries. Uh, we are dealing with all modes of transport and we organize an annual summit of the uh, ministers of transport from around the world every year. And we are uh, think tank and uh, we uh, try to cooperate with international partners to promote uh, the expertise of transport, the sector. So very happy to be here this, this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Should we go to, uh, to Heather next? 
Sure, sure. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Heather Thompson. I'm joining very early from the US. Um, I'm the CEO for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. We are a nonprofit organization, uh, a civil society organization working around the world. We're 35 years old uh, with offices throughout the world, throughout Asia, and we work on helping cities with transportation planning, support, supporting sustainable transportation, green and clean transportation in cities around the world. Thank you, Heather. And we can go to Noni for no more next. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel session. I'm Noni Purnomo. I'm from Bluebird Group, Indonesia. Our main uh, focus is in land transportation that consists of taxis, buses, um, car rental, and we also have logistics services that includes trucking and warehousing service. And we currently have uh, around more than 40,000 people working in our company. And we've been around in Indonesia for about 48 years. Thank you, Noni. And finally, we have James. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Jamie Leather. I'm the chief of the transport sector group at the Asian Development Bank. I won't explain ADB. You found your way to the transport forum of ADB, so I presume that you do know a little bit about ADB. But let me just put transport in the perspective of the organization. Um, it accounts for about 30% of our financial support at the moment, so we're looking at around $6 billion per year um, in terms of assistance, setting aside the emergency response COVID support that was outlined by our president a few moments ago. Thank you very much for joining this session. Hope we have a good discussion. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Thank you for that, Jamie. So it's really interesting. You mentioned the ADB, and of course, the ADB has just put out a study or a guidance note on COVID-19 and transport in Asia and the Pacific. It mentioned three phases of what we're currently going through, which is response, recover, and rejuvenation, how, of course, the various transport sectors have coped. So let's start with how they've responded first and the impact that COVID-19 has had on transport and opening up strategies. Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Young, because uh, we're keen to understand how ITF member countries have adapted uh, their transport systems during this opening phase of the recovery. Could you explain to us a little bit about how the various transport sectors, you've got public transport, freight, aviation, how have they had to adapt? And can you share some of the lessons on how they've adapted um, negatively as well as positively. For instance, there's been more walking and cycling options, for instance, um, and cities have had to re-space for that. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, this was, as you know well, this was a really uh, unexpected surprise because we never imagined that this would happen uh, last year, at the end of last year. And as we already put uh, in one of our policy briefs that we sent out uh, regularly, and we uh, introduced the scheme, uh, the conceptual scheme, which is uh, react and reboot and rethink. So basically, depending on the level of emergency, um, we can choose uh, the, uh, the approach, the proper approach for member countries. But I think uh, during the past several, several months, and most of uh, the countries were in a react uh, the situation because there was no guideline and and as we didn't have any precedent uh, before a lot of countries they uh, reacted on, on their own basically uh, they didn't really have the reference to uh, to consult and no advice uh, from from the past so um there were only uh, immediate measures and uh, there were quite different types of uh, the government policies used during this uh, pandemic uh, period. And some of the countries, as you know well, uh, introduced the lockdown, uh, the measures, which was quite a strict and uh, very, uh, the fundamental uh, measures to, uh, to keep people from uh, moving around. And also some, some countries, they put more, more restrictions on border crossings and uh, the visiting of other uh, the areas. But uh, the more uh, fundamentally, I would say that uh, many uh, people during this period uh, realized several, uh, several things as, as follows. One is uh, about the uh, public transport system, because we had some uh, kind of myth that the public transport system would function 
as properly and as ideally and we really like the system in a positive way but uh, during this pandemic uh, crisis we realized that public transport can be also uh, very dangerous uh, in terms of the, uh, the propagation of the virus and we need to add some uh, health factor to uh, to uh, design a proper uh, the public transport transportation system in in the future so um, many countries uh, in, in some countries we had an interesting experience that is uh, the government promoted the use of private car rather than a public transport system that's of course that's an exceptional case but um, that shows that we have to uh, try our best to make our transport system in the more resilient way in the more safe way uh, possible so that's really an important lesson and also um, we thought that uh, the transport system should be clean but uh, clean was not enough and we should go beyond clean uh, by introducing more sanitary safety measures so now uh, definitely uh, we will uh, think about that that aspect too and also we saw a lot of uh, public uh, no personal mobility devices use in, in many cities because uh, there was that, that was kind of alternative to uh, the public transport system. And even before the COVID-19 crisis, we saw already uh, the more and more uh, the use of uh, the private uh, and personal mobility devices in every uh, countries, but uh, there were uh, controversies about the regulations and um, uh, the ethical issues and technical issues and uh, all the uh, different issues. But uh, now we know that inevitably we need to accept uh, more personal mobility devices to make, to make a balanced approach uh, about the uh, transport system as a whole in, in the society. And finally, we also saw a new um, advent of the uh, technologies like a drone, because during this uh, lockdown period, we used the drone in a very positive way. We delivered goods and we uh, used it for monitoring the lockdown system. And also we tried to connect to remote areas. So basically a uh, drone was uh, kind of promoted, uh, promoted for the, uh, the productive uh, the purposes. So ITF um, having uh, 60 member countries then, and now we have 62. But uh, at the time, we tried to uh, react immediately by creating a platform, the platform for sharing information and for sharing uh, best practices of our member countries. And also we tried to connect to our international partners uh, and uh, we, we tried to uh, share a lot of information with them uh, because uh, this is not a problem of one or two countries only. This is a really a global uh, problem. And unless we cooperate, we cannot really uh, solve that uh, the problem issue. So we regularly sent out um, the policy briefs. We, we sent out seven policy briefs dealing with the, uh, the maritime issues and aviation issues and freight issues and all the interesting issues. And also we uh, try to collect the, uh, the policy options that our member countries used. So we, we share that and we shared it on our website and we try to update that uh, the regularly so uh, actually um, a lot of uh, member countries they uh, reacted uh, quite properly and timely in a timely manner but uh, as, as uh, we also um, basically uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, propagation of walking and also cycling and, and reshaping city but what i want to stress is that with those new uh, personal mobility devices we have to check if our existing infrastructure, I mean the road infrastructure is really relevant to accept all those new uh, mobility tools. So uh, that shows that in the, in the future we have to design uh, in a more flexible way uh, to cope with the advent of new uh, mobility tools in the future. And um, I will add some more information at the later stage, but uh, we really felt that the clean air was uh, precious and we really felt that. So every day while we had to stay at home and we saw the real change our, of our climate and our daily uh, air. So um, I will uh, explain that more uh, during the second round of questions. So that's uh, the basic summary of uh, what we did. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, you know, take in. That was really interesting what you mentioned about uh, personal mobility devices, drones, and of course, 
Uh, we'll be talking about the environmental impacts, which have been very positive uh, during this time. Um, next up, we'd love to hear from uh, Noni Purunomo. Um, of course, uh, Noni, you, you operate a very successful transport service in Jakarta. So can you explain to us how uh, your business, which uh, represents you know, the transportation private sector, was affected by the lockdowns? And, and what role did you play in, in facilitating the, the reopening of the city? Thank you. And um, we chose the title here, Shifting Gears Through the Bumpy Ride, because it is indeed a very bumpy ride for all of us. And it is a really unprecedented uh, time that we have to face at this moment. Uh, can, you, can we go to the next slide, please? I don't know how many of you have been to Jakarta before, and I'm sure this is what happened in all of the other big cities in Asia Pacific, that suddenly I have never seen in my lifetime or as long as I could remember Jakarta being so empty uh, in the middle of the day at the busiest was supposed to be the busiest time of the day itself. So it is really a big hit for the, especially the transportation industry in Indonesia and also in other countries. As we can see in here, there's reduced rider capacity in BRT, in MRT, even the malls were all empty. And you do know, we all know that Indonesians love to go to malls. When people don't go to malls, that means there is no transportation, there is no mobility. So it's completely empty. Although, of course, I agree also with Mr. Um, Young uh, Tai Kim earlier that, you know, we could see the blue sky in Jakarta, but it is, if it's, is it sustainable? That's the question that we have to face next, right? So next slide, please. And this has really impacted, as I mentioned uh, earlier, to the Indonesian transportation uh, companies. And as we can see in here, there's, it impacted different type of transportation in Indonesia. It, the loss is estimated to about 600 million US dollars. And this data as of April 2020. So um, in, in Indonesia, which is uh, very much so uh, affected by what happened in Jakarta, actually. Um, we are, uh, the, the whole isolation started, or the close down, city close down, if I may say, uh, to make it simpler, started in March. And so that's when, the, so that's why April, a lot of, in April, a lot of transportation company really feel the full impact of the COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. And then with, with times, I guess people could not stay at home uh, much longer anymore. So when the Jakarta governor started to do the first relaxation in June, we hope in the beginning that the reopening of the city would provide relief for our difficult situation. But as you can see in this picture, that was not the situation. So, you know, I think what is very important in here that the government is in difficult position on how to uh, start releasing the, the isolation so that start to encourage the business or the economy to, to grow again and how to manage the, the crowd itself. So I think one of the key is in the education and the awareness of um, our own health and safety. Next, please. So at Bluebird, I'm just giving you an example. Uh, as a private company, we first have to depend on ourselves. So we're pretty early in embracing the impact. So we started um, having the communication uh, sent to our customers and also to our drivers and our employees as early as February. So when we started hearing the COVID-19 situation in China and in other countries, we started the communication really early. So the, the first uh, lesson we learned is that we should embrace the impact as soon as possible so that we can prepare. But what is unique and important in Bluebird is that even when we're embracing the crisis, the first thing that we had in mind is the people's first. People's safety net is very important because we know that uh, eventually the mobility will start again. And we want to be there for our customers. We want to be there for our employees also uh, to continue our businesses and our livelihood. So that's why during that time, 
because of the massive reduction. Our revenue was down by 70% by April because of the massive reduction. That also means there's a, lot, a huge uh, reduction in the income of our drivers. So the first thing that we did is that we provide safety net. So we're distributing staple food for our drivers um, as the first important measure to make sure that everybody is in a good uh, condition, everybody's safety is, um, is well taken care of. And uh, because also of our infrastructure, we have our own clinics in all of our depots. That makes it easier for us to be able to monitor the health um, of each individual drivers. And then as a corporation, we also have to do a lot of uh, action, right? So the first one, the first thing that we do is the financial stress test and contingency plan, because we understand that because 70% hit in revenue is really huge. We, it has never happened in our history for the last uh, more than 48 years. So it, it was a huge uh, hit to us. So we have to try to arrange um, what is important, what is our priority, and unfortunately, we were planning to increase our uh, full electric vehicle uh, fleet this year. We had to postpone it. So this would be important. Uh, if any institution would like to support our sustainability project later on, please do contact us because we want to continue this. And the, the next thing that we have to do is to choose which budget that we need to cut and which budget that we need to reallocate because cash is king. And we really need to, uh, it's very important for us to, to, in order to be able to sustain, to be sustainable, we need to have enough resources within the organization itself. And the next one is to reassess the product portfolio offerings. One of the example in here is the introduction of our uh, logistic service for the taxi. Because taxi used to be only, taxi used to only be uh, used for passenger transport but because of the COVID situation, what we're trying to do is to make every single vehicle available on the street are being productive and efficient. This also um, contributed to the environment because the less, uh, the more productive each car, the, the, the better carbon um, offsite it is for the environment. And we also did the streamlining of the corporate stru structure. I always mention uh, within the organization, you know, we have to change from being an elephant to become a cheetah because so we have to change our muscle. We have to change the way we move. We have to change the way we look at things. Everything has to be changed. We have to be extremely agile. And of course, we have to do a renegotiation for our terms and uh, conditions with our suppliers, with our partners and business process streamlining, which is extremely important for any business to survive at this kind of crisis. And what is very important uh, that how to manage both managing the crisis and also preparing for the future. Because we understand, can we go to the next slide, please? We understand that uh, also, I think um, we all know in a lot of webinars, a lot of seminars, a lot of um, learning that a lot of people are talking about the new normal. What would be the new normal for transportation? That would be defined by the new normal of customer expectation and customer behavior. So what we see as, I think it was mentioned uh, earlier by President uh, ADB also, safety first. So in our term, we call it hygiene as a service, or we strongly believe that hygiene is actually now the new currency. So every single day we have the privilege that every single vehicle that we have comes back to our depot and every single driver starts from our depot. So we have the privilege to be able to thoroughly clean the vehicle to ensure safety for our drivers and for the passengers. We continuously distributing masks, distributing hand sanitizers and everything. And also we're, we're checking on our driver's health to make sure that only healthy driver can go to work on that day. We also put measurement on um, the physical distancing uh, inside uh, within our, our vehicle, including taxis and especially, of course, buses. And the second part is we're increasing low touch options, which in many webinars, it's called low touch economy. So we understand now that people still want to or have to use a transportation, but what, what they need is now to have less touching points. 
So that's why we in, uh, increase the low touch op options and activate what we call new engagement. It's the new way of engagement. Um, as, as we all know, as a taxi, we, uh, we, you can get the taxi services from the street directly or from call. And now we're focusing more and more on technology. And the last one is embracing new segments and new markets by introducing, as I mentioned earlier, about logistic services. And we also acquire intercity uh, transportation. And um, another one is also the secondhand car uh, um, sales company. Next slide, please. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing all of this with the people in our mind, people's first, because uh, none of this will happen. The company will not be sustainable if the people within the company are not sustainable. That's why uh, despite the crisis, we continue giving the uh, scholarships that have been uh, given to the children of our drivers and employees. And this year, we're, we're still giving the scholarships to, to the children of our drivers and employees, despite the crisis that we're experiencing at this moment. The main reason for that is it, it is for the longer, longer term sustainability, not just for our company, but also for uh, Indonesia in particular, because education is one of the a uh, factor that is heavily impact, uh, impacted by COVID as well, and we want to take part in that. And we still focus on employees, drivers' uh, well-being. We're still focusing on our women's empowerment program, and uh, we're we're actually focusing more and more now on how to manage um, the health and hygiene uh, education to our drivers. So we conduct uh, health and hygiene trainings and learning through online more than ever now. So we're all learning how to do things differently. Uh, next slide, please. Because this is an, an AP, ADB, so I would like to also uh, remind everyone that transportation sector is a fundamental enabler to every country's social economic activity. Um, as I mentioned, even if we're staying at home, we still need to live. We still need to have logistic trans uh, transportation. We still need to have our food to be delivered to our home. We still need to have our household um, equipment to be delivered to our home. So transportation is fundamental. And it is the source of livelihood of hundreds of thousands of our direct employees and partners as well. So what we're, we hope to get as a support is for the transport providers, for example, the demand subsidy. I think it is very important because as I presented earlier, the impact to transportation is huge. To have a tax holiday, relaxation of loans and emergency loan provision if needed, and private vehicle limitation. As I as mentioned several times earlier also that it is very important that once this pandemic is over, then we still need to maintain the green factor. We still need to maintain the sustainability factor, the environment factor. So it is very important to still limit the, the private vehicle usage. And of course, uh, to provide financial support to ensure sustainability, because most government and uh, institution at this moment are focusing on small businesses only. And it is very important to also focus on the medium or even the larger size businesses, because the medium and the larger size businesses are the companies or the organization that provide more stable income for a lot of workforce. So if the medium and the larger businesses fall down also because of this pandemic, then a lot, a lot more people would, would not have any income. And for the employees of the transport providers, it is very good to, to be able to have a relaxation on financial obligations and transport specific social uh, safety net. Maybe those are the part that uh, ADB and also other institutions can help. As a last slide, uh, can you please go to the next slide? Um, the key takeaways from this whole experience that we are facing in our limited capacity I think number one, it is very important that we are not in denial. The crisis is real, and the earliest we, the earlier we face the crisis, the the better uh, it is for us to prepare. And this, I think, is my favorite one because you should never give up on your purpose beyond the business purpose, especially in crisis. A lot of times, we 
we face a lot of challenges and a lot of people just gave up on that challenges. But if we have a bigger purpose, it always helps us to move on. Our vision in Bluebird is to be a sustainable company that allows our stakeholders, so it's not just our shareholder, to prosper. So we wish to be able to continue our electric vehicle project as soon as we can get the capital support. But in the meantime, every um, project that we're doing is really to increase our productivity and efficiency, which um, at the end will also affect the environment or uh, the green factor. The third one is continuous learning. And the fourth one is, is what unique for Bluebird also, and I think for many other companies is to collaborate, not just within our organization, but also with other institution. And maybe as we are doing as well with our own competitors. So I would like to end our uh, presentation in that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Noni. It's really fascinating to hear what Bluebird's been doing to uh, support its drivers and its communities. Uh, some really fascinating points there. Uh, we can now move on to uh, Heather. Um, I know you're part of ITDP, but uh, you've also been you know, observing travelers and transport authorities and their responses to, to COVID-19, especially in, in many urban areas. So could you tell us a little bit about your observations in different cities and, and what you make of those transport sector responses? Have, have they been effective? Sure. Um, and again, just to remind everybody, uh, ITDP is, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, please, actually the next slide. Uh, sure. ITDP is a global organization. We have offices all over the world. So I'll try to focus most of my observations from Asia, but we're certainly looking around the world. Um, and also, uh, just to remind folks, um, it's uh, sad to not be there in person. I've been to the last three ADB transport forums, so I'm imagining myself on that stage in the middle where I've enjoyed so many other uh, discussions. Um, but we've been working with the ADB throughout Southeast Asia in Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, as well as in China, Pakistan, um, and uh, even there in Manila. So a lot of experience over the years um, with the ADB. And, um, you know, as we look at the changes, if you go to the next slide, please, um, you know, I really hope that COVID is that event that wakes us all up and gets us to be serious about sustainable transportation. We've known that pandemics have been on <laughs> in the future. We've had them come, we've had them go. We know that climate change and other natural disasters are here. And now hopefully with this and the effect that we've had will really um, wise up and learn some of the lessons from this and take it forward. So I hope uh, COVID is a pivot pivotal event for the positive. Um, in terms of just the broader trends, um, certainly public transportation is down. Generally, we're seeing that ridership levels have gotten to about 20% in most cities, but um, in most cities, it's, it's still quite low. Um, as has been mentioned before, uh, people are moving into private cars, so we've seen congestion increase around the world. In many cities, we're seeing congestion at 30% on top of normal levels compared to last year at this time. So certainly an unsustainable uh, situation. We know that air quality has um, made the symptoms of COVID worse, the likelihood of catching COVID much greater, so we absolutely can't have a world we, where we move to cars and congestion and worse air quality. Um, but the good news is that we're seeing a lot of people move to walking and cycling, which we all know are much more sustainable transportation modes. And we see that anywhere from 10% to 400% increase in cities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but we are seeing, although there is concern around public transportation, it's absolutely essential, as has been mentioned already. Um, you know, some cities, uh, uh, had their services go down to zero, but many services couldn't because so many people, essential workers, rely on public transportation. So um, we've seen how public transportation is so essential to our society. And we've also seen where uh, cities are making the effort and have the, the funds to do so, that ridership is increasing again. We're back up to 70, 80% levels in some cities in China where they're following very strict measures of cleaning. There's lots of education, there's distancing, and there's tracing of people so they can understand who has it and who doesn't have COVID when they're on the systems. 
So it goes to show that public transportation can be a trusted, clean service if it's run well. Of course, public transportation is on, under a lot of stress now with all those increased um, clean, cleaning and whatnot. Of course, the costs go up, yet the revenue is down from lower ridership. Um, one thing for us to really focus on, which has been mentioned before, is smart fare systems, touchless uh, fare systems where you use your own your phone, um, which is beneficial for the touchless system, but it's also beneficial to make the systems more efficient. Um, uh, in many uh, cities, there's too many routes, too many providers. We need to streamline those. Um, uh, formalize the informal transit and get all of these systems as part of one network using one data with more streamlined, streamlined routes and more integrated fare systems, which have the benefit of being touchless as well as being able to um, uh, trace revenue much more quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, we are also seeing a huge increase in walking and cycling, which are critical alternatives. They help cover first last mile, but also smaller distances in with cities. And we're seeing people want to return to a 15 or 20 minute neighborhood, being able to walk to the health health care, walk to schools, walk to services, not needing to rely on public transportation so much. So we see cities all over the world, including throughout Asia, really investing in more public transportation systems. So uh, India just launched a Cycles for Change challenge with the Smart Cities mission of the Indian government. 95 cities have signed up so far and they're eligible for funding from the Smart Cities mission of up to $7 billion. Um, they're also planning on uh, launching a pedestrians challenge and eventually a data challenge. Um, in the city of Jakarta, uh, last year they already uh, committed to uh, implementing 200 kilometers of bike lanes this year and uh, 300 more, so a 500 of total, uh, 500 kilometers in total by the end of 2022. And this year, in reaction to COVID, they've promised to put 2,000 bike share bikes on the streets. So a huge movement there as well. And then in China, along with other countries, we continue to see huge investments in cycling. Um, they've just announced the second phase of a bike uh, highway in Beijing. In Shenzhen, uh, they've been implementing um, lots of bikeways for the last uh, in the last three years, 800 kilometers already with a promise to improve 300 kilometers every year. So huge investments going on uh, in cycling infrastructure around the world. And I think this is really the time for cities to, to follow one another and uh, get on that trend. Next slide, please. And then lastly, one of the big pushes that we're seeing is Although there's certainly a slowdown for capital spending on uh, autos, where there is money available, cities are trying to, and governments are trying to put it into infrastructure instead. So in China, for example, um, we're seeing huge stimulus uh, investments being announced in rail and transit-oriented design around rail stations, as well as IT, which includes electric, the uh, electric mobility push with buses and bikes in particular, which can help with sustainability. Um, we're also seeing cities like Jakarta invest in 25 stations, trying to increase ridership on, the, on public transportation by improving accessibility so that it's easier to get to the stations, walking and cycling, trying to make stations more open um, so there's more circulation and ventilation to make them more safe, but also to increase the possibilities for advertisement within the station, which can help with revenue. So creative models to try and um, orient trans, uh, transportation around public transportation corridors with all of this sorts of accessibility that can, again, improve ridership and create and prove trust in public transportation and get the revenues um, back up. So uh, whether it's uh, big investments like China in uh, mail, major rail or just in station designs, it's a big opportunity. And I'll end with those three trends. Thanks so much. Thank you for that, Heather. That was uh, really interesting to hear all of those developments in, uh, in China and India, even Jakarta on uh, cycling trends as well as rail trends. Really fascinating there. So we'll hope to hear and uh, much more about that. Now I can go to Jamie next. Uh, of course, Jamie, we, I mentioned earlier, the ADB has released uh, a report on the impacts of COVID-19 uh, on transport across Asia and the Pacific. So can you share some of the insights 
uh, on the key aspects relating to developing countries and how they differ uh, from developed countries. Yeah. Difficult to follow on the excellent uh, points raised already by Yong Te Noni and Heather, but allow me to focus a little bit more on the Asian perspective. But first off, perhaps a little bit of good news. Once we start into the real lockdown period, the freight and logistics, certainly the food we found in almost all of our countries was getting through. So despite the lockdown, uh, the freight services, the, ba the, the basic food stuff was making it to the market. So there was a lot of concern right at the outset how some of those things may respond. But we happy to see that across all of the countries that, we rep that we're, we're helping uh, the freight at least got through. But primarily it's the, it's the passenger services that are suffering the most. It's the aviation, it's the long distance rail, and it's the urban transport. So let me just pick on a couple of examples within our region, um, Asia and the Pacific, what are some of the key concerns currently? Uh, you mentioned the sort of three phases. Unfortunately, we're seeing that it's going backwards as well as forwards. And each day there seems to be a new backward in terms of the uh, move out of various forms of restrictions. It's a, it's, a, it's a cyclical process and hopefully we're going in the right direction, but any progression must always be measured with other aspects that are going on in society and the, the, the current health statistics as well. But first off, in, in aviation, and one of the real issues we're seeing here primarily relates around the Pacific Islands. Aviation to them is the lifeline. If the airlines are stopped flying, the, the basic services, the essential services do not arrive in those countries. And it's compounded, despite what I said earlier in terms of the freight getting through, because many of the Pacific Islands had very low, if not zero cases of COVID-19, they have put strict restrictions on the vessels, the shipping coming into their countries. They sometimes have to endure a 14 day lockdown period. Uh, quarantine before they come into their ports. Now, similar to what was Noni was outlining in terms of the financial implications on public transport and, and Heather as well, at that level, um, the restrictions or the costs on the shipping and the aviation are meaning that many of these Pacific Islands have, are, are, are to a large extent, severed from their connections to the outside world. So that is one huge difference we're seeing in there. Now, what may happen, um, I think Noni mentioned it as well, it's not just the small and medium-sized enterprise, some of the large ones. Will the national flag carriers survive and in what format? I think in, in this area, we had seen a huge growth in low-cost carriers and the uh, tourism side of flight those again will see significant changes. Um, there is an aviation session on Thursday morning, sorry, plugging other sessions during, during this overview, but uh, people who know much more about the aviation session uh, section will be able to provide the insights on what they perceive the future might look like, and that's Thursday morning. In terms of railway, the longer distance rail here, I think that has been more manageable. Quite often you do reserve seats. So there was an ability right from the outset to set people social distancing, missing seats. And again, with the limited um, long, long distance or flights, long distance rail became the only real alternative if people wanted to travel around. So we haven't seen a significant um, impact on the longer distance rail, but over the last few years, we had seen a promising sign in terms of sustainable transport. Many of the governments in the region had started to shift their investments into the rail subsector. Um, they had, over the last two, three decades, very put a big hev heavy emphasis on the road subsector, but we had seen an increase in rail. I do hope that the concerns with travel on public transport, the passenger acceptance and willingness to travel returns quickly so that shift for passenger rail can continue. The freight rail obviously should continue as is. But the big issue is really um, urban transport. Now we've heard this um, from examples across Europe, um, in North America, South America, and also here in Asia. But one key difference, and I think it was allude, alluded to or other, and this is um, one of my final points here, the big difference between many of the developing parts of Asia and the rest of the world, particularly OECD countries, is access to private forms of transport. In the bulk of our countries, in the bulk of our cities or the, the countries we, we, we provide support to, it is very low. It's usually around 20% of households who have access to private modes of transport. And by that, I mean 
both cars as well as motorbikes. The motorbike can serve as a family vehicle in many of our countries. So it, it, the option of sh giving up public transport and moving to private transport just is not an option for most. They are captive users. Um, therefore, any restrictions in terms of the service, be that by the time of the day, the, 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 the frequency or the coverage area will have a huge implication on people's ability to get to work, to be able to go out, do whatever they used to do, whether that's attending school, hospitals, work, uh, and so on. So uh, perhaps more so in this region than the others, given that there is a limited um, ability or access to those private forms of transport, the impact on urban public transport is, is very severe. Um, Heather showed some good, good examples of the increase in non-motorized transport, walking and cycling. It started at a very low level in many of our countries. Clearly some cities had very high, high, high levels of cycling. They'd shifted to motorbikes and a combination of the two. But we are seeing in some of the countries, even here in Manila, um, which was a very unfriendly cycling city, if I may say so, the government has made some strong uh, measures even on the main six lane highway that runs through the center of the city, Edsa, uh, right outside our office here, you are seeing an awful lot of cyclists. One little caveat on that, I do concern myself a little bit on the safety here. Um, you see cyclists going down the wrong side of the street and if it's a six lane road, you are wondering whether they really should be providing a little bit of guidance on the cycling etiquette and the driver's etiquette, I should say, around cyclists because I think if you grew up with that, if you're used to that, you start to understand how cyclists, how motorbikes, how cars and, and public transport would interact. If you suddenly see a huge increase, um, people are not necessarily used to that. And I do fear we may see a lot of accidents as well. So particularly just to summarize it, in this, uh, in this region, we are, again, like many others, it's all on the passenger side primarily, but the island states uh, need the freight services if the quarantine but the particularly the aviation sector is, is is their lifeline to the outside world the biggest problem primarily is urban transport like in many parts of the world but just to reiterate if you do not have options uh, then you either have a very long walk um, way beyond what is a comfortable walk particularly if it's um, 30 plus degrees outside you don't want to walk much more than two three kilometers uh, each way so if public transport is seen as an unfriendly option. People are scared to travel. Um, we've seen the, the, the cleanliness requirements, but even then people are worried about their, it's not my quote, I can't remember who actually said it, but they're saying transport is not the culprit. Yes, transport facilitated a lot of the spread of COVID-19, but the evidence is showing that on transport, be that in planes, be that on public transport, there isn't much evidence of this uh, COVID being caught on the systems themselves, it's primarily to what's happening at the other end. So while you're on the, on the bus, on the train, you're not necessarily exposing yourself, but when you get to work, when you get to your relatives or whatever it may be, that's perhaps where the other aspects are. One final point, I think the tracking and tracing as well as the, dis the cleaning of the vehicles, it, we have to look at options where all of these things are working in tandem. And we have seen in this region, many systems are looking at how to ensure QR codes or whatever else may be used when people get in the system. Green light on your QR code says, yes, you're safe to travel. Red says, no, you're not safe to travel. So it's a combination of these aspects that would bring back the trust within the system. And that's what we really need. We can't see an unsustainable shift to private modes of transport. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jamie. That was really fascinating to hear what the ADB has been up to in terms of addressing some of these issues. Now, we've had a great first part of the session, but uh, it has taken up quite a bit of time. It's really been fascinating to hear all of these developments, how different cities have responded uh, to COVID-19. But I'm going to go to the second part of the discussion now, bearing in mind there are some great questions that uh, many of the participants have uh, you know, asked uh, to our wonderful panelists. So I'm hoping I can get to those questions too. Let me start with round two. This is the section where we look at the new normal 
uh, resulting from COVID-19. So we heard from uh, Young Tae Kim just a little bit earlier, you said you were going to share with us a little bit more about what you've discovered in terms of some of the positive aspects of COVID-19, and that is clean air and reduced CO2 emissions. So can you tell us how um, ITF and, and their members support each other in developing transport systems that take advantage of some of these positive changes? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's true. Uh, we, we, we can remember that uh, from early 1990s, uh, the global community was focusing, has been focusing on the climate change issues since the first summit in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. But it was in 2015 that uh, almost any country made an official commitment to reduce the CO2 emissions in, in Paris. So we uh, signed a Paris Agreement in 2015. But uh, the question was um, how we can really achieve the goal that we made ourselves. But uh, at the time, I was also working in the Ministry of Transport in Korea and dealing with the uh, green transport myself. And uh, at the time, uh, the most difficult thing was that basically uh, the environment ministries were participating in the negotiation every 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 year and they brought homework to uh, distribute to different ministries uh, in in the government but basically unless we have a strong coordination and relative uh, relevant coordination on this issue we cannot really achieve the goal but uh, uh, for for a, for a long time that remained in me uh, like a kind of the myth and uh, the ideal ideal uh, situation uh, uh, that we, we should uh, reach uh, at some point. But uh, during this pandemic uh, period, um, I really observed that it could be possible because every day I saw it with my eyes and I felt it with my body. So even though I had to stay at home and every day I could see uh, a clear uh, blue sky and fresher air. And even I consulted some uh, satellite images about the earth, the how the earth was experiencing also new things. So it was really a positive, uh, positive aspect. But the, the question was uh, how we can really quantify the impact of the government measures. So um, we have a lot of uh, uh, the policy options, like uh, uh, we can try to change the behavior of the people, and we can also develop some uh, technological uh, the uh, fuel efficiency engines or something like that. But the technological aspects seemed relatively easier because we can easily quantify the impact. But if you want to say uh, that uh, public transport is better than private car use, then how can we prove that in a more quantifiable uh, aspect? It was a great challenge at the time, but um, uh, it was a little bit by accident. Uh, that in, in last July, uh, the ITF launched a very ambitious uh, directorate, uh, the reference, big reference, so-called uh, TCAT, so Transport Climate Action Directory, that contains uh, more than 60 measures the government uses. So every measure uh, shows its quantifiable impact, how we can uh, uh, reduce the CO2 emissions if we use this option. So uh, at least now we have uh, a reference for transport people and environment people and even for academic researchers. So um, it's a living document that should be updated and modified uh, step by step in cooperation with the uh, real experiences of member countries and international communities. But at least now we have uh, a certain uh, uh, quasi objective uh, reference for everybody. So that was a great achievement of ITF, and it was a really uh, uh, productive uh, contribution to the uh, transport community and the whole international community. So I think uh, if we uh, know this, uh, the objective quanti quantifiable uh, data, then uh, we can uh, productively uh, use that, uh, use that uh, for everybody. So I think um, we we a uh, little bit contribute uh, to that, and uh, now it's uh, the ball is in the uh, court of every uh, international partners, and uh, to uh, make it a complete set of measures and complete set of reference. 
I think uh, we can really uh, cooperate more with our international partners like ADD because as Jamie mentioned, uh, uh, in Asian continent, the situation is quite different from uh, the situation in Europe. Uh, I also come from uh, Asian uh, background, so uh, I know that quite well. And uh, this is a really a good time for collaborate more in, in, that, in that sense. Thank you, uh, Kim. That was great. Very interesting, um, you know, observations there. We can now move on to Noni. We we know you've told us a little bit a little uh, earlier about Bluebird. It's a, a very innovative organisation in the private sector in Indonesia. It's always pushing the agenda in terms of newer technologies. You talk, talked a little bit about the low touch uh, technologies earlier. So tell us a little bit, uh, Noni, on how you see the emerging change in in trip patterns and how that's impacted your taxi services and, and urban mobility options. Could you explain some of that briefly? Yes, thank you. We, we could see the change of pattern now because uh, before COVID, for example, a lot of people would travel from outside, from the suburban area to central Jakarta to work. And then at the end of the day, and then they move around uh, central Jakarta and then at the end of the day, they would come back to their to the suburbs again. So now we, we see that um, the pattern has changed. So some people still commute from suburb to uh, a central district, but it is much less. So a lot of the movement of the transportation, the mobility is within the vicinity of the suburban area of because of because the change on the work behavior, right? A lot of people are uh, doing work from home. So that that also changed the pattern of transportation itself. And to cater to that, um, we're doing several changes. But what is most important is I think it mentioned uh, several times that some people started to use a bicycle as one mode of transportation. But um, you know, the, the situation in Jakarta in particular, it is not that comfortable to cycle from your home, which is like one and a half hours away down to your to your office, right? By the time you get to the office and you just wasted the time. So what we're uh, doing is that we're catering to, to that needs as well. We have uh, our van taxis. So we, we started to introduce that, oh, we can carry your bicycle, you know, you and your bicycle from your home to a certain point and then you can cycle to, to the last mile. So we're changing the pattern of the taxi usage uh, itself. And for this, we also uh, invest, I mentioned earlier that we are reprioritizing our projects, but one of the project that is based on technology that we're actually making it more of a priority instead of, uh, it was planned to, to be done in 2021, which is the AI implementation. The reason for that, the reason why we, we, we're implementing it now is it comes back to if we want to focus on sustainability, it is extremely important that we also make sure that every single vehicle that comes out on the road are being used effectively. So productivity and efficiency is very important. That's why we're focusing on that so that we can have a better understanding of the change of consumer behavior. We can have a better data on uh, predicting the supply and the demand so, uh, so that we can really run the operation very, very efficiently. And a taxi is, is the closest mode of private public transportation, right? Because you're just there by yourself or with someone whom you actually know. And so for us, um, we, we're taking that opportunity so that we can focus on how can we help giving that a hygienic factor to make sure that every single vehicle is in a, um, a clean condition through safety measurements. And also how can we make sure that every single drivers are in good health uh, not just providing cl free clinics for them, but also we're providing free dormitory for them so they don't have to commute and go back to their home, which we don't know who they're meeting, right? And so this way we can contain our internal community better. So uh, yes, we do invest a lot in technology for AI and for touchless payment, as I mentioned, but what is very important also is to manage the people who's actually running the operations itself. 
Yeah, some really important points there to note. Thank you for that, uh, Noni. Uh, we can move on to Heather now. And, uh, you know, we've been hearing all about the, the responses to COVID-19, uh, what governments were doing, really fascinating to hear uh, your take on what's been happening in terms of trends that you've seen in cities around the world. But do you think uh, COVID-19 will, will induce real structural changes to the transport industry? I mean, what would your recommendations be uh, to authorities and transport companies and how to make those structural changes be more sustainable for developing countries? Um, if you would please, would you put up the last slide that I had? I just want to show an image because I think it really brings it all to the front, which is, you know, I, again, I really hope COVID is a pivotal change, a structural change to the way we think about our transportation systems. And so much when we, so much of the time when the, we think about transportation infrastructure, we just think about a road. Um, but what we really need to do is think about complete streets. And if you look at this image, you can see people centered in this. It's not about moving cars, it's about moving people. And walking and cycling is the main part of it, just as much as public transportation and other private modes. But there's fresh air, there's openness, there's open space. And I think this is the structural change that we've got to have. And if you look at this, there's immense opportunities for infrastructure and technology. This looks like a simple streetscape, but really it's an intermodal connection with plenty of bike sharing, bike parking. Um, you can't see it in this image, so it's a little fuzzy, but you know, these are e-buses with e-mobility hubs. There's plenty of shade, there's open space. People are at the center of this. And we saw at the time of the Spanish flu, um, in Europe, in, uh, in the US, there were parks that were built, public spaces that were built in reaction to the Spanish flu. Boulevards were opened up and built bigger in reaction to the, the Spanish flu. And I think that's the same thing we need to do here. We need to give people more options. And again, we need to think about transit-oriented design so that cities and areas are developed with mixed use, compact, uh, dense, uh, development so that people don't have to travel as far. Miss Noni mentioned how in Jakarta most people have to travel an hour for their commute, but I think the whole commute patterns will be changing. People will not be uh, changing as far. They'll be looking to stay in their neighborhood and get their needs in a 15 or 20 minute uh, walk or cycle trip, and that's what we need to be building our, our transportation hubs and our transportation centers around that kind of concept. People first, it's about resiliency, it's about having redundancy so that when we have these tragic times, we're not just reliant on one mode and we cannot go back to a congestion car driven world. Uh, we've learned from this air quality will, bad, ter terrible air quality will literally kill us and we can't do that. So people centered, cycling, walking centered, um, transportation design is what we need. Thank you for that, Heather. And yeah, I love that photo. It's, it's brilliant. I hope that is the future of transport going forward because, you know, we've already been hearing, you know, Jakarta, the Philippines and other cities in Asia, you know, it's so different. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was congestion. It was terrible air quality. It was a lack of safety. So in fact, that takes me to my next question for Jamie. Uh, very nicely because, you know, we know that the biggest impacts on transport relate to uh, passenger services, whether it's aviation, long distance rail or urban public transport. And in fact, when I, when I have moderated previous transport forums for the ADB in Asia, the focus has always been on how to reduce urban congestion, poor air quality, you know, the economic losses mm -hmm. due to overburdened transport system. So, Jamie, what are some of your views for a more sustainable new normal of transport across Asia and the Pacific? Thank you, Sharon. Um, first off, just reiterate that um, transport is a means to an end. So people don't travel for the sake of traveling. What the new normal may bring, as we've heard, obviously, those that can are working from home. E-commerce has taken off considerably. It had, didn't have much penetration rate, but now it does across the Asian Pacific region. 
so th these will have a profound impact depending do people go to the office every single day will they go once a week will they be looking at different types of commuting uh, to local environments and then coming to the main office uh, much more seldom will they travel to go and buy things or will they see them being delivered through the through the e-commerce transport must react to some of those components as well so a, a lot of the impacts are beyond the transport so we must keep abreast of what is happening and ad within transport and adapt to those as and when they evolve so there's a th there's a huge um knock-on effect and transport will have to be reactive to those external factors but they can also drive some of the factors internally as well and particularly on that one i think it's time as as, as heather slide put to reimagine sustainable urban transport it, it is the ideal opportunity um, there's a double issue that the, the the current transport operators are facing and as only put is it's a revenue side and a demand side so those two Pincers are really putting huge pressure on, um, on, on urban transport, the, the public transport operators. Within many of the very large, very, very dense Asian cities, there is only one option for sustainable access and mobility, and that is mass transit. We cannot see large commuting by private modes of transport. There simply is not the space for the cities that we currently have within, within Asia. So we do need to see a reinvigoration of urban transport, mass transit systems linked with last mile connectivity or even longer bike sharing schemes, pedestrian, attractive pedestrian areas that they can connect from their house to the stations, from the stations to their places of work or school, whatever it may be. And that above all else is the, is the key. But given the financial side of what I mentioned, is it time to start thinking of public transport as a public good? Like never be before we have, if I may call it an experiment of what happens when you shut down a public transport system, you shut down the city, people can no longer go to work, it, 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 it's very difficult for anyone to get around. The, 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 bent, the knock on and sort of talking broader here in terms of sort of the cities are responsible for vast majority of the economic activities within countries, 70% of GDP, some estimates put the urban areas. If, the, if those urban areas do not have an efficient or an effective mass transit system or a public transport or localized trips, then you are losing a huge proportion of your economic ability and growth. Um, we have seen in the past congestion accounts for about 6% GDP loss. But what is your one hour commute? Um, Pre-lockdown, the average commute in Manila was closer to two hours each direction. That is a huge social burden as well as an economic burden. So is it time, as some of the European countries and cities have looked at, really using, going beyond even um, sustainable urban transport or mobility as a service to, mo uh, to public transport or urban mobility being seen as a public good. It has to be there to allow the cities to function. And if the cities function, then we can see economic growth and prosperity spread across there. So I do believe it's really a, a, an ideal opportunity, or I hope it's an ideal opportunity to reimagine how we conceive urban access and urban mobility. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jamie. Now, I'm looking at the clock. We have about 10 minutes, and we've got these great questions that I want to get to as well. But uh, before we get to that, um, I do want to ask my final question to each of you, and I think you've all brought up some really valid, thoughtful points about how transport could look like in the future. But so far, you know, what we do know is the current situation. We've been talking about transportation, uh, you know, in terms of how we know it, you know, mass transit systems, you mentioned, Jamie, uh, you know, and airlines as well, uh, they profit from large number of travelers and passenger loads. But of course, the new normal now suggests that unless an effective vaccine is found for COVID-19, we can't return to that old model, that pre-COVID model. And so I guess my final question to all of you will be, if you can describe in one sentence what the new normal will look like, how do we emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic with a new future uh, of, of transport, what would it be uh, for each of you? So let's start with Young Take Him again, and uh, we'll go to one sentence from each of you, please. 
it's very difficult because still we have a lot of uncertainty about uh, tomorrow. Uh, and even though I said uh, we are in the react situation, basically we are now experiencing another second peak. So basically we have to react again, 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 again. But um, instead of telling uh, the concrete, uh, the image of the future new normal, I want to stress once again that uh, we need to add some more dimensions and colors to uh, the uh, transport system in the future because we know that the safety and security is important and green transport important innovation and connectivity but the, now we uh, edit we added we just added a big item which is called the sanitary aspect and so far uh, we didn't really cooperate with uh, for example who uh, on that regard but now it's time to uh, have a more holistic approach, uh, collaborating with non-transport sectors and, and different uh, geographical entities. So um, now it's time to uh, unite and uh, collaborate more on the issues. Then uh, the, naturally we will uh, know what we might, it might come uh, tomorrow. So it's not easy to describe it in one sentence at the moment. Thank you. All right, well, you're, you're right, it's not easy to describe in one sentence, but Noni, I, I may ask you to stick to that because we are running out of time. So let's hear from Noni. Thank you. I don't have my crystal ball. That's one sentence, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think what is needed more than ever now is an integrated transportation system. And um, it will change. We don't know how it's going to form, but one thing for sure, mobility will still be there whether it's people movement or goods movement, but mobility will still be there. It just depends on what form and how we combine it. Thank you. So Heather, your one sentence, please. Not a crystal ball, but what I hope to see, I guess, um, which is systems that are truly built around healthy people um, and realizing that public transportation is absolutely essential so we need to find a way to make it healthy, but also to give people healthy alternatives, walking and cycling and making sure that our streets are truly built for safe walking and cycling. Thank you. And finally, from you, Jamie, your one sentence, and then I'll get on with some of these questions that everyone's been asking. I'm always the optimist, so I see a much brighter future. We're not exactly sure how that is, but I think access to data, being able to analyze that data, innovation and crowdsourcing techniques. We have a couple of innovation challenges that we're running at ADB within transport and those will be highlighted tomorrow. I see a, a much different future, hopefully a better future with much greater use of the data and the innovation. And here is one of the innovation challenges. Please go on the app, find that um, and join us. There are prizes for the uh, most successful. We will support those to be developed. Thank you very much. That's great, an innovation challenge, nothing like uh, getting everyone into their competitive spirits. But now I'm gonna open up to these questions. Now, a lot of you have asked some really intelligent, very insightful questions. Um, I'm gonna pick up on the one that was sent earlier. And uh, again, this touches on uh, some of the things that uh, the president of the ADB talked about, uh, Asakawa-san. He articulates the need for SDG in uh, safety data, and green. Now, while there is a great deal of talk uh, about resiliency and sustainability, which of course we've been talking about in this session, uh, which we all agree is very important, I would like to hear about finance and with decreasing revenues, which we've also heard about, and increased expenditure, how will countries tackle this unprecedented deficit? Great question. Who wants to answer that? I could have one go. Um, I, I think on the finance, again, it goes back to the point, should public transport be seen as a public good or should it be full revenue generating and covering the full operating costs and even infrastructure costs? I think the answer is clearly no. Um, if you compare it to the roads subsector, there's huge hidden subsidies that are, are not as explicit as they are and, and as Noni would know exactly it, in the returns or the financials of a public transport or a taxi operator or a, a bike sharing operator, they are very exposed to the nuances within cost. 
um, much more so than perhaps on the private side where you build the infrastructure and yes, you are taxing on fuels, you're taxing on vehicles, but to a large extent, that full cost recovery of maintenance comes from central budget. It doesn't necessarily come from road user taxes, but should we be looking at a very different type of public transport financing mechanisms, providing a service and getting paid for that service that is provided rather than fare box collection having to cover your revenue side. And I think given the financial difficulties that many of the operators are finding themselves in, many governments may be looking at no option but to provide financial support to those. And how should that be funded? Should it be seen as a, a, a public good or a financial support to those systems rather than in the belief that they should be self-financing. I think those days are long gone and we should be looking at public transport as a service as opposed to a um, self-financing entity. Thank you. And I can maybe jump in. Um, I think there's so many opportunities that are out there for revenue um, that can be win-win opportunities. Um, in cities around the world, we see uh, many more starting to limit and charge for parking. This is a huge area for revenue generation as well as a way to control congestion and often give land back over to areas that then could be used for walking and cycling lanes. So limiting and charging for parking in cities can be a huge opportunity. Another is to uh, consider charging for driving, congestion pricing and other forms of um, low emission zones, zero emission areas where you price based on time of use, demand or time of day can, other be, uh, can also be a huge source of revenue. And we see cities that have put, been um, considering those plans for a while, including cities like New York City, um, that are looking to put those plans in place again as a, a major revenue uh, generating opportunity um, where you can uh, you know, use that for loans and investment like cities like New York have done. So it's a, as we see congestion increasing, it's a way to control congestion, um, get on top of that, but also, again, a huge revenue opportunity. And we're seeing more cities start thinking about that because of the revenue generating opportunity. So I think there's a number of win-win possibilities. And those many, can, that money can then go into dedicated sources to subsidize public transportation. Great answers, both of you. Anyone else want to tackle that uh, question? It was a great question. If not, I'll move on to the next question. Maybe I can uh, add one more thing. Maybe, uh, as, as, as some people say, crisis opportunity, and I, I think it's time to uh, break our silos in, in transport sectors, because inevitably we are heading uh, toward the situation where we can really co-subsidize and, and also um, we uh, promote uh, interaction between different sectors in the society. So uh, if we try to solve the transport question uh, only by looking at the transport sector, we cannot really move forward. So now it's the time to uh, break the walls that we uh, really had in the, in the past and uh, maybe uh, we can uh, redesign uh, our policies for the future, uh, combining a uh, transport with uh, different uh, areas like health and education, even uh, urbanism and housing sectors. So I think uh, we need to have that wisdom too. Thank you for that. Well, it was great answers uh, to that question. I'm going to move on to the next question uh, in the chat. Uh, another question from one of our attendees. And, you know, essentially, this is the challenge we've been talking about. This question talks about, you know, pandemic experts saying that it's going to take two years to get back to normal. Uh, two years will be too long for any public transport operators, especially private bus operators, to sustain the reduced demand. So what recommendations would you have uh, to the government to, to modify privately operated public transport to government or government and private combined operation in which the government subsidizes the financial losses. So an interesting question there. Again, I think it's uh, covering some of the you know, areas that you have covered as well uh, for our panelists. So does any Sorry, I think we were losing you, Sharon, but let me jump in if I may. Um, I think it goes back to the point where 
public transport should be providing as a, as a service. It should be performance indicators and operators are paid for the levels of service they provide, not so much the fare box anymore. So we're moving to more uh, KPIs of the services are provided, how many buses a day, how many, what is the headway, the frequency, what is the cleanliness, what is the level of service they're providing. So these gross cost concessions are what we should be looking at. Now, as Heather was referring to, how do we come up with some kind of sustainable transport fund that allows for these to be funded from parking fees, from vehicle access, such as congestion charging or ERP in Singapore? How do we combine of those, as Yongte was saying, we need to look beyond the little silos of the subsectors or a bus operator or a taxi operator or a bike share to look at the the overall system of transport most trips take many different modes and so we have to look at a transport system that gets someone from their house to their factory or to their school or whatever it may be via all modes so i think we need to look at a very different financial structure and how payments are made thank you I might uh, jump in and add, um, although I know it's sometimes politically quite difficult, I think this is also an opportunity to try and streamline routes. Um, as we know, in many Asian countries, um, systems are not based on performance contracts, but are often kind of mini franchises with lots of operators. Um, that are somewhat organized, but not always organized, and often running at low to no margins. And I think this is an opportunity for us to basically look at the data that we have, look at where people are actually moving, and rationalize the route so there are fewer operators that are operating on larger margins and have the ability to actually financially make it in times like this. It's already hugely challenging, but we are seeing cities around the world take advantage of this opportunity to really streamline their operations. And again, to move to things like operated integrated smart fare systems that allow for the business operations to also be integrated in the revenue system to uh, operate much better from a, a business operations perspective. So even though it seems like this is not the time to invest in those sorts of, of uh, streamlining, I think can, can pay off a, a big, in a big way, even beyond COVID. Okay, that was a great response. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we are two minutes over <laughs> in terms of the length of our session, which is meant to be an hour and a half. Um, would we like to hear more questions? Because there are some great questions, which uh, I hope our panelists can get to at some stage. Um, perhaps a show of hands on uh, more questions or shall we wrap up at this point? Okay, by that I mean, let's just aim one more question, shall we? Because there are some good ones here. Um, you know, and I think this again goes back to what we were talking about earlier and this is, the idea of a post-pandemic world, what will a uh, you know, post-COVID-19 world look like? Um, and this is a great question. You know, what are the major obstacles to long-term growth in the post-crisis world? And what must the region do to successfully overcome them? Um, and again, you know, you've, you've suggested some, some ideas earlier, you know, congestion charges like we have here in Singapore, something called the electronic road uh, pricing system, which is very effective. Uh, we've seen some cities implement that, but you know, what are some of these other potential solutions uh, to how we can address transportation in a, in a post COVID-19 world? If I may? Yes. Hey, yeah. yeah. I think uh, the question is quite difficult in that it takes a lot of time, definitely. But I, I want to stress that um, maybe in the future, uh, the platform, the platform solution can be uh, a solution for everybody because it also relates to uh, the efficient use of data that exists separately, but it's time to make uh, different types of platform as we already saw the cases of shared mobility and uh, app-based mobilities and et cetera. And even in the developing world, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people already use uh, the cell phones and uh, 
the personal devices that can connect to uh, different areas. So I think uh, from uh, government sector to private sector, we, we have to think about uh, how we can uh, efficiently uh, put in place our sharing information uh, using uh, different tools of communication, and that can create an efficient platform. So uh, if we connect it, uh, it's a matter of uh, the perspective, who initiated that, the connection and the platform. So uh, in the end, we are heading uh, toward the situation uh, right now, but I think uh, in a more strategic way, we can, we can uh, pursue that, that movement. Yes, Jamie. Just very quickly to add, I think there's been a lot of talk about service improvements and efficiency gains, and I think we'll all agree that data and innovation can allow us to get there. But I would also stress that the investment and in infrastructure is requirements are still huge. Uh, so we may see a lot of economic stimulus packages being put in. Um, as Heather's slide, last slide showed, we should be investing in a very different future than the big boulevards, we should see an integrated boulevard. So that combination of system improvements, efficiency gains, coupled with those economic stimulus packages to, and then we could see major investments in transport, but transport uh, infrastructure plus, plus. So we get the access, we get the connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Now, if anyone wanted to add some final words, I thought uh, what Jamie just said seems to sum up the session really well. Um, I will go ahead and end the session now. So thank you once again to all our participants listening in. A big thank you to our wonderful panelists who've been incredibly insightful about what a, a post-COVID-19 world for transportation in Asia and the Pacific will look like. Uh, once again, I want to remind you about the innovation challenge. Uh, which uh, Jamie mentioned earlier, that's the ADB program. Uh, and, uh, you know, please get your ideas in there. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to be moderating this session with you. Um, I will hand it back to the ADB organizers. Thank you all. And thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. That was great, thank you. Um, Is it only the panelists that can hear now, Michelle? Michelle. We still have 290 attendees. Are we...